Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am Alta's digital editor and the host of Alta Live. I am so excited to welcome you today with a conversation with Tung Chiang, studio director at Heath Ceramics. You are in for an absolute treat today. If you are already a fan of Heath, if you are unfamiliar with it at all, either way or everything in between, um, we're going to get to look at some amazing ceramic work. Um, and hear from one of California's most exciting artists. A bit about Tung. Tung Chiang is the creative lead and studio director for Heath Ceramics Clay Studio. He's also worked as a graphic designer, a furniture maker, and an industrial designer. Tung was featured in Ulta's Made in California issue. Um, we've been calling this internally our craft issue. As one of the forward-thinking makers and craftspeople working on the West Coast today. In fact, he is celebrating this month his 10th year, his full decade at Heath Ceramics. Before we begin, some brief, brief housekeeping. Alta Live is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. You can join us for a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work we do presenting weekly events like this, our monthly California book club, an array of free newsletters, as well as, as getting this quarterly beauty um, in your mailbox. So if you've been considering joining us as a member or giving it as a gift subscription, now is the time to join. I will include a link to that in our chat, as well as remind those of you who've been here before, this interview will be recorded, posted to altaonline.com later this afternoon and emailed to you. So keep an eye out for that. We'll also include links to Robert Ito's interview with Tung in the magazine um, where you can buy Heath, as well as um, how you can continue to support Alta. There's a Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Please ask your questions for tongue there. We'll chat for about 30 minutes, as well as look at a, a slideshow of some of Heath's work, and then get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, it is so great to be with our community today. I see people from the Mission Springville, San Francisco, um, Novato. I am here in Novato. Tung, where are you zooming in from today? Well, um, while the background look like I'm in my clay studios, I actually uh, calling in from Toronto, where my mom's and my family lives. And so there's a three hours difference from you guys, and there's snowing out. And it's quite a nice weather right now. Um, not too cold, not too hot, but it's beautiful outside. So, but also thanks for the introduction but also thank you for inviting me here. Oh. And thanks to all the audience to calling in. We are honored to have you. In fact, um, and, and especially while in Toronto and visiting your family. I We've kind of discussed a few questions in advance and Tung, the first guest in Alta Live history to put together his own slideshow for me. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, we're gonna talk about some some, of your amazing work as we do. Um, but but can you kind of give us a rundown of your, forgive me while I figure this out, um, of your role as Heath and, and when that began? Um, it's interesting to like, I just celebrated my 10 year anniversary today. And um, well, this month, um, more precise. And so I joined Heath Ceramics, um, in times that like we starting a clay studio in our new missions um, factory. And I carved it out a little corner to create a studio space that allow me as a trained designer, also a, a potter to able to um, design and handmade at the same time. So I'm very lucky to find this amazing company to able to carve a new space that eventually start my career there. And then the goal of this studio is that like using my skill set and eventually we continue to learn. We call ourselves, it's a ceramic company, but focus on design as well as manufacturing. So my job now is focus on what is design means to Heath in the current stage. And Heath has been around since 1948. Can you tell us a little bit about that history? Well, I'll tell you a brief versions. Um, so 
this is a photo that we are sharing here. It's a photo that is 1948 in our factory in Sausalito. And on the next slides that you see here, that um, you will see the factory in our current stage. And this is the same factory that we took the photos that on the 1948. Um, for the next slides, you can see our founders and um, also some of her early work. Our founder is Edith Heath and also Brian Heath as well. And Edith trained as an art teacher and then um, as well as learn about ceramics uh, by herself. And then in 1940s, she started making ceramic and then introducing her uh, work through one of the exhibition in this uh, Legend of Honor. And since then, she developed her work first starting from hand thrown, eventually developing to a factory setting and producing to a larger quantity. Her idea is that to bring beauty to everyday life. And so and, since and you get to work with her, oh, I'm sorry, you get to work with her, her niece now? She, there's still family members involved in the company? Yes. So I'm sadly to say that like Edith and Brian both passed away and I never get a chance to meet both of them 10 years ago. But um, the legacy continue. The amazing part is that like Winnie Crittenton, she has been working for us uh, over 40 something years and she's the niece of Edith Heath. And then for the last couple of decades, she become our great specialist and she has been providing so much expertise in terms of how glaze and clay work together. But if you can have a chance to meet her in person, she's just a wonderful super lady that is all about passion, about glaze and the material. Like, shall I move forward? Yeah, sure. Like, so you see the coupe line that from the last picture transformed to the current pictures. The last picture is about hand thrown. The, now the, the white rim, like the coupe one uh, design line that you're seeing here is actually manufacturing from the factory since 1940s. We also win the Good Design Award uh, in 1951. And uh, the same design has been producing from the same location since then. And we are continue keeping the legacy of her, her work. How much is that? I realize I'm diving in on our pre-discussed questions here, but how much is is Edith's kind of original um, aesthetic um, drive the current design? Are, are you constantly asking yourself, what would Edith do? I do and don't. I have a very interesting relationship with her um, because I never met her. But yet, at the same time, there's book about her, there's writing, there's uh, oral history about her. But also, most importantly, I think like there's also a, a large archive that is her hand-thrown work and her experimental work that we kept as a history. Beyond the, the pieces that selling in the showroom, there's a vast um, collection of work works and also dialogues that I can learn from her. By listening all this story, seeing through her work, understanding her mistake, in a way I kind of calling her my kind of grandmother that I never met. And in this case, I think like I have a very sentiment relationship with her. Do I ask myself what will her thinking when I work yes sometimes but it's less about that it's more about like when I working I will say it's like oh like what will what is she doing what will she approving will she enjoying seeing new things what is her brain thinking but more importantly because the work that in front of me was representing so much more than what we are selling now I see there's a lot of different pockets in her brain, more than just one side. Sometimes I pick one side, sometimes I pick the opposite. Sometimes I play the, play the uh, pick up the, the manufacturing aspect of her, but sometimes I'm thinking about like the playfulness and artistic of her. Sometimes she could be very stubborn. Sometimes she could be really kind. And then like, so all these things kind of influence me. And sometimes it work for me, sometimes don't. And then I'm kind of select and choose and piece uh, uh, from her perspective. 
instead of asking what do you think or how she's going to design, sometimes I actually wonder is like, what she think of me? Yeah. And yes. Will she approve it or is she going to hate me? Um, well, maybe one day I will find out when I met her again. <laughs> How did what what inspired you to to begin your work as a master ceramics artist? What drew you to ceramics as an art form? <laughs> okay, the word master is difficult to be claimed this day for me. Um, I don't think I'm far from mastering the clay and craft from perspective. I've been trained as a designer over thirty years now. So I think my strength actually is about combining design thinking, understanding, human aspect while understanding my personal drive and then combining the skill set and um i would say it in terms of the craft side of me i'm still learning i'm still trying to like um as you say mastering it daily but yet i feel like i am in the really grounded state that like i feel design become part of my body language i don't think too hard i don't work too hard I think they come as I speak. So like, I think like that is how I work nowadays. Can you talk a little bit about the process? Heath is such a, a company with such a storied history and such a, a strong founding aesthetic. Can you, what's the process for developing new products at Heath? Let's try to see if I can find the right slice. Could you mind yeah. go forward to a few page? Sure. One more page, one more. A few more. Um, there he is. Oh my God, that is me. Um, so this <laughs> is my studio, actually. That is where I work. And I got lockouts. I got the best space in the San Francisco building. Um, let's this go to the, the next slice design. to see. Oh, this is my design series. So I'm going to jump around. Maybe we, would, okay, we can great. talk about this one a little bit uh, sure. before we go back to your questions. Uh, as I'm a studio director at Heath, I actually introducing a concept like around 10 years ago, I call it design series. And then so the coming year, I'm going to be celebrating the 10 design series. Each year I pick a theme and the themes is could be like in this case, the photo representing candle holders. And next year could be vessel. The next year could be lighting. Uh, last year I did was a planter. My goal is this. It's not about finding one design. In design industry, we oftentimes as a designer, we train like this. We train as a pyramid. You bring in a broad spectrum of idea into a table and eventually you select and go through, create and eventually find out what is the last idea that maintain and push forward to become manufacturing. In my feel in my studios I actually go in reverse instead of focus on the one last item I actually focus on the possibility get it as wide as possible because my job is not about finding one design that fit into our production line but instead to find out what we are as a design company to moving forward for the next 200 years so like it is this spectrum that like allow me to create a range of design no matter they can start from form or functions story or care they can each design is kind of representing a different story so each year i'm using the same theme in this case the candle holders i may produce around 100 200 pieces of work and then eventually evaluating them understanding them we ask many questions, but one of the useful questions actually for me is that like, while many design could call better or good design, but not all good design is a Heath design. What does that mean? Why a good design fit well at Heath? Why sometimes a good design doesn't feel like Heath? It was those questions that learn, allow me to learn what could be Heath and what is the future look like? So that is how, kind of how I, creating my work throughout the years for the last 10 years, and then also how I'm kind of paving um, the design language for the futures. Is that question of, is this Heath? Is this design Heath something that you get to decide? Is there a committee of people who get that Heath aesthetic and kind of give it the, yes, that is definitely Heath. I don't know if this is us, thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, Heath is a 
mid-sized company, but in terms of creative team, we actually is really small. So like in this process, when we say asking question like this, the, the most influential is between me and Kathy Bailey. She's the owner, but also our creative director. And then between us, we talk a lot about design, why it work, why doesn't, why this surprise is still working. And so those are the kind of like the sharing between two of us. But internally, we also have the other teams that no matter they focus on communication or industrial design, we will also share with them as well, eventually hearing from different perspective. And I think it's a it's always continue as a dialogue and it's not about who making the final decision. Just like this concept here, it's not about one thing that stands out. It's a collective of thoughts from many things happen at the same time. I wanted to talk a little bit about Heath's collaborations that, that your company has been doing with other companies around the world. Shall I? take us forward yeah on let's, our journey let's here. go forward to a um, few things so here we go our tech am i saying that correctly yes this is our tech our tech actually is a finnish company they uh the name actually represented art and technology and which is founded like 1930s and they're just celebrating their uh 87 anniversary it's founded in finland with uh architect uh from alfa auto um How am I moving to and me? what we like about this cover and work together with this brand together is that auto design has been classic and has been influenced everyday life for like last 80 years and his ceramic is over 70 years we have opportunities to share our vision how share how we um using our resources how we focus on local manufacturing and then so the result actually is combining the clay and uh, the wood together to create a new um, product. And if you go to the next slide, actually, it's a little story that I kind of trying to illustrate what is this tile table means to us. I'm drawing this auto stool is based on this banded leg. And auto and Arctic products is using the wood from local forests and from Finland. And when I was thinking about how the clay um, connecting to the wood, I thought about this natural environment. The tree is coming from the earth. The clay and the earth around it is protecting, supporting, and giving the nutrition to the wood. And eventually the wood being harvested become the lake. But then now the tile is putting on top of the lake. You're almost reversing that like the tile is almost like the clay before. Instead of supporting the wood, they're asking the wood to support them. So it was this kind of interrelationship between earth and tree, wood and clay that is interesting to me. And then so eventually this collection is about connecting these two material again together. So the final result is a collection of tile table. You see two of them, one in front of us is a long rectangle one with the tile tops. And then on the further one is a side table that has a uh, smaller uh, square footprint. I really yeah. need to have this table now, now that I know the story about, which makes it so, I mean, how fascinating. I did not think of the wood and the roots of the wood growing in the clay and, and that connection, the thoughtfulness, the, the extreme kind of time and thoughtfulness that goes into something so beautifully simple um, is extraordinary. I thought about this quite often for the, for the last few weeks, particularly because this table has just launched like a few weeks ago. It's still displaying in our showrooms. The product is online now. I've been launching this, we have been launching this in Finland, in Japan, and now in San Francisco because Artec is a Finnish store. Their client is really strong in Japan. And now we are in San Francisco. Through the design, which started two years ago until now, it gave me a lot of opportunities to think about like the, the reason and also what are we doing? I recently watched a, um, documentary that I found is super inspiring, which which I thought is quite interesting that um, 
it's completely unrelated to design. The documentary is called Everything to Nothing, or um, it's about as big as Big Bang, as small as quantum theory. Um, so like, I couldn't quite understand why it draw to me until when some of the scientists explaining why the Einstein formula was so simple and eloquently explaining a relativity so well. And I thought, wow, designed a final product. It's not about just the product itself being there, but it's about a thought that come behind it need to be eloquent enough to able to explain the idea to allow the audience understand easily. And that helped me to continue to understand why I think the clay and the work, the wood could be continue working. So I was quite fascinating. Since then, I've been actually diving into watching so many science, doc science documentary, which sadly I failed so many times in my class when I was in high school in science <laughs> or biology. So there is a difficulty for me to understand everything that they're talking about, but yet it is same time to so using the perspective, but applying on design is quite fascinating. Anyway, what we are looking at this now is actually, it is a simple design. It's about using tile, combining the surface for the wood uh, support, but we use our strength of what his tile is, which is the variation of glaze. So you're seeing this picture that like, even though they all looks green, but this subtleness of differences of this uh, green is what Edith intention. She founded Eve Ceramics 70 years ago. Her intention is about producing this imperfectionness also is about this variation that instead of like a kind of like a uniform color that everyone was trying to achieve. So in this case, we're celebrating it and using this as our starting point on this collection. I imagine putting this together, however, you don't just throw a bunch of glazed tiles on a table and call it a day that each one is, is thoughtfully placed and each glaze, the, the subtle differences among these greens have a aesthetic purpose. Yes, actually like um, to produce this, Variation of glaze was a math mathematic calculation. It's about understanding how glaze reaction in a low to lower and higher temperature of fire, but also slightly changing of the ingredient of the glaze. So everything you see here has the same proportion of different glazes here. Like let's say we have 15 pieces of glossy tile, 17 pieces of like matte tiles, Five of them are a little more green towards yellow. Seven of them is a little bit blue. So everything is precise. But when they lay out into the surface, each piece was laid out from our principal designer. So each pixel that you see as a tile is actually determined by her experience and her artistic inputs. So even though they are manufacturing, they are mass production, but there's no two table look alike, even those the ingredients is the same. I in your in your interview with Robert Ito that you did for Alta Journal, you mentioned that leaving the opportunity for mistakes or chance to appear in your work. Can you give us an example of of a time that that has happened and something unplanned ended up as a final product? Let's go find a right slice to talk about this. There's a yellow bow. <laughs> Okay, here. So um, this is a mistake accident as also talking about expiration. Our glaze formula actually could expire when the settlement of the mineral being there for too long, the ingredients change. In this case, uh, this case the yellow glaze should be smooth and able to cover the whole surface. But while this batch of glaze being old, like uh, between six months to 12 months, it creating this crawling, which is common in the glaze um, world. And by factory standard, we will recycle them. 
and then we use it for something else or like recycle them and then we're creating a new batch. But since I saw that, like when I accidentally asking for this yellow glaze covering a surface, when we need to spray it in one X, one piece, and then the result looked like this, I was like, wait a minute, do you throw, recycle this glaze? Let's keep it, do something with it. So I've been celebrating and using this crawl, crawling of glaze to kind of like creating a smooth surface that almost the glaze crawl together, become a droplet of glaze. They run off, they spill off from the surface, expose a lot of the clay surface, but yet the clay being contaminated with the yellow tone. So even the dusty surface on the clay, you can see a little dot of yellow that is kind of embedded inside. So it's not about the functional aspect that draw me to this glaze, but it's about the expression of this fragileness, this kind of like uh, an expected result that there's no two pieces alike that is kind of, so I eventually throwing one really super thin paper thin bowl that is not about stability. It's almost like almost like always wanting to tips. And yet at the same time, the glaze, it's almost like don't want to adhere together. So I'm using this as the accident and eventually combine them together. Wow, it looks it the natural quality to it. It reminds me of moss on a on a tree or on a rock. It's beautiful. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about ceramics as an ancient art. Um, the the kind of it, ceramics are both art pieces, and and you are an artist. Um, but it's very useful. It is an art that, while I do have my bud vase here that I keep very, I you know rarely will put a flower water in it. Um, cause it's a treasure that I keep, but, but so many of Heath products are meant to be used and used for coming together, for nourishing oneself, for one's living space. Can you, can you talk a bit about both the art and the importance of youthful, um, usefulness in ceramics and as part of kind of the Heath mission? Okay. Big time out for your question. Now I have to ask a question back to you. Okay, for the next seven days, you have to go to your garden, cutting flowers, put it on the bud vase, because we make that beautiful enough to stand alone by itself. But yes. the bud vase will be super happy and uh, <laughs> feels thankful if you are using it. Okay. I trust. Please trust that like this bud vase, I have dropped many of them on my wood floor and they're even strong enough, sometimes they don't break and they are very robustly built. So like, please use them. They will be super happy and thank you for- uh, I, I will email you. you a photo. Yes. My bud do. vase in use. Okay, promise. I think for me, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry to hijack your questions. And- no. um, Great, do it. I, well, like, let's go back to we visit your question one more time. Let me rethink uh, what was you asking because I jump on to find some I'm questions of like or find some slides of of some. There were some that we we skipped over of of you know the usefulness that this is a family table. This is a this these are meant to be. These are beautiful and stunning um, pieces, but they're also meant to have pasta on them and salad and forks scraping across them. Presumably. Well, so like, let's talk about a little bit of the story of why Edith started uh, her design that way. Um, the story come like this, she, her mother will bring out uh, Sunday China, which is the special ceramics every Sunday after the church and they're beautiful, well ornamented and decorated. And she look at them, say, it's like, you know what, like something so beautiful, why we can only use it one uh, day a week, why we cannot do it every day. And eventually that become her philosophy about creating her design. The coupe line that we saw earlier or the rim line that you saw a few years after the coupe line was designed with this aspect is about things that is beautiful, but yes, simple enough that it should be used every day. Um, our glaze may be worn, my, the clay body may be a little bit uh, uh, scratched up, but that is okay. That is our intention. And 
we make it strong enough, but also beautiful enough to withstand every day. I think like that changed me a lot in terms of design. I grew up from advertising world, graphic design, industrial design. No matter where I was, there's a urgency about a company want to speak louder to be in the market, to allow you to allow the audience grab the attention or allow us to grab the attention of the audience that becomes some of the aspect about design is about drawing your attention to us. The design itself is so amazing and exciting. But yet sometimes those designs being stamped on a certain time and date, Edith, she was so bold and strong, said, you know what, I'm going to simplify everything. I'm going to let the material speak for itself. The glaze speak for itself. The form is simple, functional, everyday use. This has been become the biggest challenge or like the, the, the direction I have in the rest of my career is that how can I make something also as strong, interesting, but yet at the same time, it could last for past for time. So I think she's extremely successful and we hope to continue to carry her this success for a long time. Is the the clay that you use or the glaze that you use specifically designed or culled to for that strength for that kind of ability to withstand time and use Edith is a very smart self-taught artist she actually didn't train as a potter but she trained as a ceramic chemist so like she actually learned about the ingredients before she learned about design so she created this formula herself. The clay body is her formula. The glaze also has formula. It's about two aspects. One, they are strong. Second is actually they're using a very low temperature of filing. Two of them combined together means that we are losing, using less energy, producing a strong product that can use every day. And it is this genius is from her that built the foundation of our material. Where does the clay come from? Is it just like uh, clay the ground mixed with? Sacramento. Oh. So, so Heath ceramics, which are in Japan and Finland and throughout the world, it's using clay from Sacramento. It's so all to try. Yeah, like, so like we are so lucky that like we are able to kind of connecting all the dots, creating them. The material is come near us. The factory is within San Francisco and Sausalito. We continue keeping this our mission to able to uh, produce goods from this uh, local resources. I don't know which slide I'm on here, but I did. I did, but I do want to make time for audience questions. But I also wanted to to touch on the does place does Heath's origins in the Bay Area in San Francisco and Sausalito inform in any way the design. Um, and the aesthetic of Heath. Yes, the clay body is so unique. I oftentimes, when I design something, I have the material in mind before the concept in mind. And they, the clay body is strong and uniqueness enough that it creating limitation of what is the expression eventually can be. But it was this limitation that creating the boundary, but yet at the same time, it's about almost like a focusness that I can think of, like an tangible, tangible touch and feel that guy my design. So like I think her material, her glaze, or the old factory that we're still using in Sausalito, you will see her sample gluing on the wall, the same machine still there, and all of this originalness from the material story and the building and uh, the manufacturing process that inform us how we're going to be continued. So they are go hand in hand. I cannot just say that, you know what, I can design anything, I can go anywhere. My design, even those if the same design, if I don't use her clay body, the result will be completely different. It's this. This is actually one of the most amazing time of Edith's achievement. She building this tile wall in Pasadena for Northern Simon Museum. And she 
win the AIA Architecture Award from it, and she's the first woman to win this award. And imagine the whole building is wrapped around with this large tile, but look at the variation of the tile. That is where she liked her work should be. And that is the inspiration become the tile table project that uh, we have. There is a story that like Winnie often told us her niece saying she will walk around the uh, tile factory, go behind all the glazing person, glazer, and then eventually tap the shoulder, say, relax your shoulder. Don't be too tight. Allow them to be various. You don't have to be that consistency. And that is her spirit about design. I love your um, your passion for the origins of Heath and for Edith herself. It's it's inspiring and feminist. Oh, I wanted to ask you about what is this that we're looking at? This is incredibly okay. To, to, <laughs> well, before jump to this one, I want to oh, answer yes. your last comment. Is that like don't forget she's my grandmother. I have to respect her. That is how we should treat our grandmother. Um, this slides I actually want to share with you and the audience about what a potter um, we have as a tool and the boundary that we have. I'm joined this when I was starting design a whole series is about bow. I joined an axle, which is the vertical line down. I joined two oval shape, like a round shape, the top and the bottom. Think about this as a potter, we work on wheel all the time. So everything that we made is evolving based on the axle, which is the center. So imagine a shape is just evolving around the center. If that's the case, as a designer, I only have few perspective to play around. A is the top circle, how big they are. B is the bottom circle, how big they are. C, the last element, is this curve that connecting the A and B together. In my design world, that means I only have three elements to create all the hundreds and thousands of variation. Mm -hmm. I find it scary and exciting at the same time. So I've never been designed with such a limited perspective, but yet with this simple theories of constraint and understanding of how form emerging from a wheel, that allow, allow me to understand every single aspect count. The little dimension that we choose the top and the bottom change everything. The curvature, no matter it's smooth or jaggedy, no matter the straight or rounded, every single aspect represent your intention. It was this minute detail that scare, frightened, but yet at the same time is so groundbreaking for me. Wow. Oh, go. Okay. I do want to, I want to kind of to get to the end of this and get to some, some audience questions. Is this is the original? What was the name of this? The coupe lines. This is our coupe lines in a current production form. So uh, the beauty of the coupe line is that there's an exposed rim because the clay was invented by uh, Edith and she loved the warmness of this smooth clay body. So instead of your most of the time, Back then, most of the ceramic actually is glazed with the rim. So you never see the glazed body, like the clay body, until you flip the part, the part upside down. But in this case, she actually exposed the rim, allow you to able your lips, your body, your hand can touch it. And it was this simple gesture to talk about material, but also design it at the same time. Wow. So um, thank you that thank you um all right so we've got some some questions um from our audience that i wanted to touch on um do you know they they must have been contemporaries did edith heath know ruth asawa the great san francisco based sculptor and a equally trailblazing female artist i actually not so sure i know but i actually know um i yeah like i think they must cause path and but i'm not 100 percent sure that's another documentary that needs to be made of these extraordinary I women know. artists coming out of the bay area 
um, who deserve more credit. Um, is that was the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena? Was that the museum you were referencing with Edith's tile? It's extraordinary. Yeah, I should go visit Andrea it. Like see it. I highly recommend anyone not only going to the museum, but also go outdoor to their outdoor cafe. And you can see so many beautiful sculpture like Henry, Henry Moore, a beautiful uh, lily pond, but the wraparound tiles that circle around the building, it was just spectacular. Highly recommend, it's one of my favorite uh, hangout spot. Tung, my last question for you, I don't know if you're able to answer this. Do you have a favorite piece that you've created for Heath? If we were going to go buy Tung Chang's favorite piece at Heath, what would we buy? Um, should I answer as pushing sales or should I answer of telling the truth? So like, let's <laughs> please tell the truth. Go everyone, go <laughs> buy Heath products. They're beautiful. You have to use your bed vase if you have one, so it's happy. Um, but no, what's your, give us the real scoop. <laughs> so the real scoop is that there is actually one little bird sculpture that I built for Design Series 5 is about animals. And that piece, I only make a few of them and they all sold. So unfortunately, I don't think you can find them anymore. But that piece representing a story, I'm going to wrap it up really quick about that. It was a bird that um, when I was in college in, in art center in Pasadena, I was sitting in my living room and all of a sudden I hear boom sounds to the glass and a hummingbird just hit the glass. And then eventually he fingered on the floor. I was nervous. I went outside in the balcony, pick him up and he was sitting in my palm slipping or fainted. And then eventually for the next 20 minutes, he was stone and move. And, but I can feel his warmth, but I can feel his breath. It was this fragileness that holding my hand for 20 minutes that completely moved me. And 20 minutes later, I was trying to like watching him come back alive, standing up and eventually flew away. This sculpture that I made is um, representing an injured bird. It was a stylized bird that is almost at the shoulder. It's almost like it is located. He was in this sleeping position that about is talking about a story of um, sickness, death, and fragileness. And from that point on, I realized that my work could add emotion. And I think not only that work relate to me because of this 20 minutes of special time that in my life that has such a beautiful connection to the wild, but mostly, I think that allowed me to understand that me as an artist can have my voice. It's not a profession that is always about calculation and proficiency, but it's about my personal experience as well. So that was my favorite work. Well, that answer was totally worth it. Thank you. Um, with Thank that, you so Tung, I am so grateful to you before, before everyone leaves and we give tongue the last word. Um, I do want to let you know Alta Live will be on hiatus next week for the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and we will be back November 30th with Sydney Love and Chris Renfro. Renfro runs 280 Project Wines. It's an organization that helps BIPOC winemakers um, in San Francisco Bay Area as well. There's a, a vineyard out in San Francisco. We're going to talk all about that with Sydney and Chris, along with Alta's editor at large, Mary Melton. That's Wednesday, November 30th at 1230. Um, again, we're going to shoot you links to this interview, info about Heath, um, Robert Ito's interview with Tung. Um, and with that, Tung Chiang, I am so very grateful to you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for like spending a wonderful hours to talk together. Oh my God, so much fun. All right, everyone, take care. Have a great holiday you week. Guys.